Hello, everybody, folks, and good morning. Welcome to another edition of Know Your Unit. Today, we talk about the absolutist of units, and that would be the Beast Tamer. Uh, this is a class that on its surface looks fairly mundane, but in reality, the true beast that they were trying to tame was themselves all along. They are an absolute operator of a class, and let's get into this here. So, uh, the Beast Tamer is something that you get in early Chapter 1. Uh, if you kill off the first Beast Tamer that you encounter uh, over in the Archopolis of Orion, uh, you will already start off with three of them, and then by Chapter 2, they're available in the shop. They are a class that, by its uh, description, is meant to uh, tame and support beasts, but uh, that's more of a secondary feature, so let's kind of get into it here. So, for one thing, in terms of their weapon axes, uh, they have access to fists, axes, hammers, cudgels, whips, blowguns, and bows. This is a fairly weird selection of different stuff, but here's the thing. Whips are essentially the spear for when you don't have a spear. Fists are your way to do counter poison, along, well, since they don't have spears. Axes are your way to, uh, you know, one-shot griffins with their ice finisher. Hammers are pretty good for that same thing, but also might be able to give them some charm potential with Caldeas. Cudgels are a nice way for wizards to retire into something, uh, you know, potentially a bit more explosive. Um, actually, specifically when I've been routing the speedrun recently, I've been uh, going and changing Olivia and Sherry into one of these. Um, specifically because they need their cudgel skill for their most powerful ability here. Blowguns are freaking amazing in general, and then bows are a nice little backup plan. Alright, so other skill-wise, they got their usual uh, uh, HP and MP buffs. They get access to Steadfast, surprisingly. Uh, they get access to Siege, already then. Um, Petrify and Charm, still no real explanation for that. Anyway, their strongest ability here, and gold as it should be, is Lobber 4. Uh, so this is essentially going to be a 3-8 to eight tile uh, uh, item throwing ability. Uh, essentially, they are a mix of the, uh, the chemist and any kind of grenadier from any game ever. But here's the thing. Uh, while you can use them to uh, throw uh, support items and things like that, these shots over here are something that, while not the most expensive item in the shop, are a fairly kind of middle-of-the-road expensive uh, weapon that you can give them that will allow them to be essentially a wizard that skipped wizard school in favor of stopping by their local ammunition. Um, essentially, this is a, a type of attack that completely just bypasses the normal defensive types. Uh, it's essentially a locked-in set of damage that uh, will scale itself based off the weapon skill of the unit in question. This can potentially get really ridiculous. So, for example, you know, later on uh, in Chapter 4 and stuff like that, if you were to, I don't know, find some weapons over here that happen to, you know, cause their weapon skill to skyrocket uh, even higher than you'd kind of expect at this point, which actually they're using fists, but th I probably should be using something that actually boosts it. That might help with this particular example. Uh, let's go ahead and find an axe unit if we got one. Did I make, make an axe one? Okay. So, <clears throat> if we go over here and we cause their axe skill to suddenly go up to 90, this means that this is maxed out. Uh, just so you know, for the sake of comparison, the double Yama thing is held up as, you know, a crazy thing, but this actually caps out at 90. Um, so, what the hell am I even on about here? Why does this matter? Well, the uh, the way that this thing scales is extremely locked in. This essentially means that uh, when they're when they're going and throwing out these shots, it will not check for defenses. It will not check for a lot of other things. For the most part, it, again, the numbers will vary a little bit. They'll be affected a little bit, but for the most part, it's just like, oh yeah, around uh, this point, they'll, like around, uh, let's say, skill about 30 or so, uh, like 20 to 30-ish, uh, they're pretty much guaranteed to do about 200. By the time they get to 40, they're guaranteed to do like 3 to 400. By the time you get it up higher than that, suddenly this causes them to have a locked in, essentially like tier 4 AoE level of, uh, of damage here, and potentially going up to like the 1400s by the time you've maxed out. Bear in mind that uh, these also get scaled up by physical up cards. So this essentially means that they can completely dominate a bunch of uh, in a bunch of uh, situations by simply getting one or two physical up cards. Um, and bear in mind, even on their own, even without all of this scaling up, uh, this essentially means that they can have some of the most absolutely ludicrous uh, alpha strike potential in the game. And I am comparing this with a lot of the other ones that are considered top tier. I did directly compare uh, Beast Tamers and Shamans uh, when it came to, uh, uh, to Alpha Strike potential and just kind of map clearing stuff in general. And while these guys were more expensive in terms of their, uh, their equipment required, they in general were typically getting about a minute uh, to potentially higher than that uh, faster clears than a full team of Shamans there. So anyway, 
Bear in mind this was with equal numbers, all of that kind of thing, but just to give you an idea of what we're looking at in terms of potential under ideal circumstances. Um, this was ideal circumstances for both. So let's get into their other skills here uh, because that's not even it. Obviously they have their taming abilities. Those are all well and nice. And power, which automatically gives a, about a, I think it's like 50% increase to the uh, attack potential of a beast or dragon. And then right here, you may notice this is something that they're all going to be running for this map, which is Repel Dragon and Repel Beast, aka they just occasionally cannot be touched by those two particular things. So if you, for example, have a map that is very heavy in terms of beasts and dragons, well, they can just go ahead and decide that damage just doesn't exist for them right now. <laughs> So, in many ways, they're kind of like the uh, the Fencer or Valkyrie in terms of being a unit that really can do it all, and can do it all really well. For the purposes of something like a speedrun, uh, they're a unit that essentially any rando unit can go and uh, immediately pivot into without losing any potential and essentially reaching the height of their potential immediately, because their biggest uh, hitter is going off their weapon skills. And that being said... Even with uh, only four attacks, even though that is usually enough on its own to clear most, most uh, maps, this also means that they can that they can essentially open up with uh, lobber shots, get close, and then immediately have a bunch of finisher spam available. They're a class that is again like tailored for just instantly clearing maps. It's kind of uh, kind of hilarious in that regard. Again, that's why they're basically the operator of uh, of your team here, and all of this is actually uh, obviously a. Uh, quite a bit easier if we're looking in terms of, let's say, you know, the infinite money uh, uh, exploit uh, with Balder Blowguns. This means that from uh, pretty much from chapter two, you can immediately just start, uh, you know, bomb sniping the entire game with no questions asked. In fact, uh, that's probably the optimal speedrun strategy at this point. I've specifically tried to avoid uh, using this, but, uh, you know, you can just basically set it to AI and watch the uh, the team detonate the entire world. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. Um, so again, lobbers into finishers. That is their deal. And you may have noticed here, earth, uh, uh, earth grenades uh, going on a wind unit. You'd expect that to take a penalty, but no. They seem to be kind of like magic in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, not really getting too much of a penalty for attacking the wrong unit. Um, you may notice that they have not even been touched yet, um, despite the fact that, you know, they're trying to charge all their guys forward, uh, but uh, there is a non-zero chance that they end this fight without a scratch. Um, so yeah, as far as Beast Tamers go, on their own, again, they're not necessarily much of a slouch uh, when it comes to physical hits either, uh, having access to uh, pretty much heavy variants of a lot of melee weapons. The only things they don't have access to are going to be uh, spears and uh, uh, swords of various kinds. But again, the axes and hammers will generally do the job just fine. They've got fantastic uh, finisher access through a lot of their different weapons, uh, particularly something like axe and blowgun gives them really, really good access to finishers, uh, giving them off the top of my head, uh, let's see, earth, ice, fire, lightning, uh, I believe wind, and I forget what the other one is right now. Um, and yet, the weapons that you give them almost don't matter because it's all about the finishers and the, um, uh, the lobbers with these guys. As you can tell, they don't really need to take basic hits most of the time. Um, it's just completely unnecessary. Not to mention, unlike wizards and things like that, there is no casting animation. It is simply chuck, boom, and that's it. Um, so yeah, they've uh, they've got this one down on lock. And in terms of the overall price of those shots, by the way, uh, like I said, currently uh, when I've been messing around with speedrun tech and things like that, um, they have, generally speaking, still been a viable strategy, running about uh, three to four of them on the team, even without the money exploit. Um, so simply, they end up saving so much money on other options based on just being able to be a universal damage dealer like this. That you, it actually kind of ends up saving you money in the long run there. Um, in fact, uh, in that particular speedrun, starting off at around, um, I think it was in Chapter 2, where you get that big money dump of like 50k from a bunch of uh, fights uh, right when uh, crafting becomes available, um, simply investing entirely uh, once Chapter 3 rolled around. So like in, in Chapter 2, you get some crafting done, but then you save some money, and then in Chapter 3, essentially you dump all of that money into uh, conflagration shots just to kind of make it easy. You can match them to their particular element to make them a bit more, you know, effective at using them, but realistically, it's it's a little bit of a bonus. Uh, these are a very flat damage kind of thing. Um, and so you can tell that uh, even matching them, like, th matching them is going to be, all like, it's going to help, but it's logistically a lot easier just to turn everybody into one element. Um, 
and so yeah, uh, this uh, this kind of created a situation where that by itself created enough shots for that team to be able to function well into the very end of chapter two. Um, I think, uh, or sorry, the end of uh, chapter four rather. Uh, so pretty much right at the end of the um, the Alphonse fight is roughly where you start uh, starting to run low on shots and things. Um, but anyway, this also carries that additional benefit that uh, because they will be completely ignoring defenses in a lot of cases, any particularly high armor uh, units, so for example uh, something like uh, like uh, Dorgi, uh, will be taking full damage from them. The only exception is anything that scales down. Uh, so for example, something like a Phalanx or um, a Dragon Scale will be able to resist the effects of a shot, but uh, high armor will not. So, so there's that. And as you can see, they're still <laughs> getting great damage off of uh, stuff like their short bows. They're still getting great damage off their uh, physical hitting weapons. Because of the fact that they're a very strength orientated class, um, this actually does allow you to do some interesting stuff with their builds as well. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, taking advantage of... Oh, sorry, I'm hitting the wrong controller here because I'm so used to uh, using the deck. Um, uh, but for example, uh, uh, using their uh, primary weapon uh, as a, a blowgun there uh, to get something like, you know, the Petrodart's uh, 15 strength bonus, um, and then going and using a short bow in the offhand for the counter effect allows them to counter petrify things and stuff like that. So, lots of options for these guys. Uh, again, another uh, potentially useful uh, uh, situation here when it comes to those, uh, those cloud shoes, because it seems to give them a little bit of extra range when throwing. Um, just a really fantastic class that's very easy to set up. Um, hopefully the music in the background carried uh, about the equivalent uh, meaning that it should here. <laughs> really, just sending these guys out on AI reminds me of uh, going and just like spamming grenadiers in uh, Command and Conquer. <laughs> they just sort of show up and stuff starts exploding. Um, and yeah, even on finishers, as you can tell, they're still like these are again complete nobodies out of the shop at this point. Um, they're still doing all of that same stuff. It's uh, it's the same old team, you know. Did end up borrowing back the switch for a moment to show this stuff off. Um, in terms of the kinds of weapon axes that they get shortbow wise, um, it's actually really worth running uh, shortbows and blowguns on them because they don't really need that basic attack uh, damage very much. And usually they're going to be taking enough as it is uh, to, uh, to just build up their TP for those finishers. If you want to run support on them, uh, you can always uh, run something along the lines of, um, of uh, just additional items on there. But I really didn't see the point, uh, considering that, yeah, so far they've had one unit get knocked down, and I'm not even sure how they managed to pull that off off the top of my head. So, yeah. Um, also, you probably don't want to run three of them on cudgels. I just thought it was funny to do so. Um, but I would generally say something like uh, Axe and short bow is going to be pretty much optimal for them. Uh, or even something like uh, the uh, Tiger Claws right there. Because if they're taking counterattacks and they can drop some counter poison on there, it's just going to be a good time. Uh, they're going to do kind of moderate damage on their own, but anything like, let's say, heavy-wise, like something like a Griffin there, uh, will be taking substantially uh, more damage from something like Claws, um, just due to that poison. Because again, you know, 10% is 10%. Uh, generally, even uh, endgame humanoid units uh, running around 1800 health, uh, that's still roughly going to equate to about like 560-ish or so per round, so that's pretty significant, uh, all things considered. It's either that amount of damage, or potentially you're trading it in uh, for uh, for somebody wasting their turn to drop an ease, which is a fairly, uh, fairly expensive move. So, anyway... Hopefully you get the general idea here. Oh, he picked up a physical, and, well, he's out of uh, out of lobber shots at this point. I guess we won't see anybody throwing uh, any 2,000 uh, damage grenades, but, oh well. Yeah, they can, they go up very, very quickly. Um, in fact, uh, with just uh, one physical card, uh, you even, uh, like, at level 32 or so, I've seen them getting up to about 380 damage versus bosses around Chapter 4 there. Um, so if you end up completely uh, stacking for physical cards, which there are ways that you can do, uh, essentially just use one shot to break a bunch of tiles, uh, go and uh, collect yourself some cards, move on from there, it does lead to a lot of very interesting uh, kind of uh, tech there. Um, but abusing something like that could lead to uh, one-shotting bosses with these things under the right circumstances, and uh, yeah, that right there is why whips are awesome. This Armageddon um, is something that uh, is going to be ridiculous in their hands. And realistically, if I had the parts on this particular save file, I would have just uh, had whips on everyone. So, all right, there we go. There's the uh, the showcase of what we can uh, do with these guys. With, again, the most basic setups that we got. 
But if we want to go ahead and take a look at their other options real quick, let's give that a little bit of a peek. All right, so. Uh, we got like this guy with counter claws. We got this lady right here uh, with the uh, the glacies, which again, 10% extra griffin damage. It's an it's an ice thing, gonna be a really good counter for them in general. Um, something like a short bow and shield works out pretty all right on them. You know, slight extra bonus uh, defenses and offenses from that. But it's really these finishers that are gonna be the star of the show there. Uh, something like uh, turning uh, wizards into a non wizard grenade wizard is just it's pretty darn solid. Um, uh, actually. Uh, well, actually, that's a video for another time. We're not going to get into that. Um, something like uh, whips, or, again, the spear for when you don't have a spear. Um, and, yeah, in terms of uh, dragon uh, scale stuff, uh, they get access to the boots, they get access to the armor, they get access to the shields. So you can, for example, run dragon slayer bows. If we were to uh, go and swap this out real quick, we can go ahead and show that off. So that can potentially be very handy on maps that actually have dragons on there. So, you know, if you wanted to take uh, advantage of some of that ridiculous damage, there you go. Um, in terms of their uh, uh, melee weapons and stuff like that, uh, they get access to all of the uh, dragon variants of those as well. So if you want Dragon Slayer through claws, if you want Dragon Slayer through axes, um, if you want Dragon Slayer through hammers, you got that crap. And you got one-handed on the uh, hammers as well. Um, I just noticed I forgot to set up the avoidance build for this one, but it's basically the same thing for this one. Are you the avoidance one? I think this was the avoidance one. What would that actually look like? Because that would basically be like Sanguine Hammer for that avoidance. So we put that on there. Uh, probably Rezenzi is probably going to be the highest uh, avoidance that they got uh, shield-wise for this one. Because, yeah, that's going to be a six. Uh, who's got the Rezenzi? You've got the Rezenzi. Let's put this on you. Let's see how high we can get your avoidance. Can we get a... Yeah, we can easily get it above 200. Um, helmet-wise, yeah, still two from this one, so that'll do fine. Armor-wise, uh, I don't think we're going to see too much avoidance going on here. A little bit from Brigandine, a little bit from Balder. I'll just say Brigandine will probably cap that out. Gloves are still no, because they don't really have any avoidance ones in the medium category. Uh, spark guards are fine, but we're looking for the extra greasy avoidance from these ones. And... Yeah, I would definitely not recommend uh, stacking avoidance on these guys. They don't really need it. But then again, you know what? Actually, hmm. Well, 222 evasion. Um, that kind of thing that actually might be a really solid case for them. They do give up a bit because they have to use that ring of evasion. But like, you know, if you get the uh, the right uh, weapon, uh, like uh, for example, you get uh, some of those uh, like god weapons there. I wonder. Let's see. Does this give good avoidance? I mean, it gives five. So if they were to use this and then they would switch it into uh, switch into axes and stuff, I mean, yeah, that could work. I mean, it would end up going up to 70. It wouldn't be quite maxed out, but it still would be ridiculous. Anyway, so, that'll be that. Y'all have yourselves a good one. Oh, uh, right, right, right. Other things. So, counter, uh, counter, uh, um, uh, uh, charm over here. Counter petrification, if you want it, as an option as well. But again, 15 strength bonus off Petrodart. This allows for a super tanky build right here. Um, just because, again, Strength will give you a uh, physical defense bonus. Um, um, it's not going to really show on, like, your physical stat sheet here, though, so I don't know what that's all about. Uh, but just so you know, that is a thing. Actually, no, there it is. Because just uh, going for Petrodart, uh, this one's got uh, Daedalus. So if we go for equipment that's roughly equal here, uh, then, yeah, their defenses are significantly more. Uh, so, yeah. Either way, it's it's notable is the thing. All right, so y'all have yourselves a good one. Take care, and I will see you in the next one. Have some fun.